How's it, Mzanzi? And welcome to Farmers Inside Track. This is episode 282. I'm your host, Dawn Numdu. In today's episode, we're exploring the fascinating realm where tradition meets innovation, the world of edible insects. We'll be sinking our teeth into a plateful of questions from the cultural diversity of insect consumption to the nutritional benefits they offer. Joining me is Puti Kabasa, founder of Mopani Queens. Puti, thank you so much for joining me on Farmers Inside Track. I think I've known you for, I think, almost two years. I was introduced to your brand. It could be three years. When I saw Mopani Queens on Food Form Zanzi, I was like, I need to speak to this lady. She seems to be doing big things. And I'm so happy to have you here. And to have you tell me more about your business, more about the industry, and also just edible insects in general to kind of understand it better. Thank you for your time. Hi, Dawn. Lovely speaking to you. Thank you for having us as a guest. I am the lady behind the brand Mopani Queens. We're a company that sells Mopani worms or Mopani caterpillars in different various forms. We spice them and we turn them into chips. Basically, just making it easier for people in South Africa or wherever they may be buying the products from to enjoy the wonderful insect that is Mopani worms. I'm also one of the founding directors for an NPO, a recently launched NPO um, called Edible Insects Farming Association of Southern Africa, which is a body that basically exists for advocating of edible insects in Southern Africa, in South Africa, in Botswana in you know all the Sadek countries. So we're interested in getting people that are involved in edible insects, whether in farming them or in selling them, to get the different people together so that we can, you know, share ideas on how we can get more people, more of our countries involved and in taking up more eating of edible insects, whether eating it for human consumption or using it as feed in agriculture so that we can just get together and get to know who are the role players and how we can assist each other and help the industry to grow. Part of our last conversation when you were just establishing this body, or at least in the beginning process of it, I was really excited about it because I don't think a lot of people know that insects you know, can be eaten. I mean, at least not in some cultures, but in other parts of the world, it is more popular and people consume it almost on the daily. Maybe you can tell us, you know, what does the landscape actually look like? Where do people eat what? I was in the vendor area and I could easily buy Mopani worms in the local store, which in my region in the Western Cape, it's not as common. So maybe you can give us a bit of, you know, information about, you know, some common edible insects, where they're consumed and also the cultures around the world that they consume them. I like talking about, there's a very famous line when you're in this industry that worldwide, 2 billion people eat insects every day. And then the next question is, what about the rest? Why aren't the rest eating it? And every day we try to come up with the reasons why people are not eating insects and how to get them to eat insects. Now, when you're bringing it down to South Africa, where we are, we know that at least 3 million people in Limpopo and KZN alone, that's 3 million, eat insects every day. Whether it be mashonja, whether it be locusts, whether it be magege, there's a whole lot of different insects that we need here in South Africa. But that is just a study that looked at the two provinces only. So throughout all of South Africa, we do find people in Eastern Cape, in Western Cape, in Northwest who eat different forms of insects. They may have eaten it back in the days before what uh, people moved on to what is now considered more of a Western form of diet that we eat in South Africa. Some are still eating it as it is today. You'll find different locusts. I've heard of people who eat moths down in Eastern Cape as well. So there's a whole range of, of insects that we enjoy in South Africa. Obviously, in the warmer parts of South Africa and in Limpopo, it's a whole different game there. In December, when the rains come, that's where you find a lot of insect harvesting that takes place. You'll find people picking out termites, for example. They're very enjoyable. There's also flying ants. There's also, obviously, the caterpillars of the emperor moth, which are your mopani worms. 
and a whole different types of locusts that you'll find. Insect eating is not a strange phenomena. It's something that's been happening for many years. And it actually makes sense, Dawn, that you say when you go to some shops in Limpopo, you will find insects. Yes, you can find them sometimes during the year and then maybe now in winter you won't find them, which is one of the things that we have identified as IFASA that we need to have a much more sustainable source of insects. And how do you go about doing that? That's where farming comes in. How do we farm Mopani? How do we farm locusts? How do we farm uh, Mageke so that they become much more readily available and widely available? And we can even find ourselves at a point where we're able to distribute to the whole of South Africa and people in Eastern Cape can be able to walk in a shop and say, yes, Mopani worms, I can buy it, for example. I would easily buy it if it was available in my local store, to be honest, because I think it's such an exciting and an avenue that I haven't really explored as much and I'm really interested in it. I'm really enjoying this conversation, you know, just finding out more and how I can be involved. I mean, just picking on some parts that you said, obviously, depending on the area you're at, depending on the landscape, depending on the climate, depending on the season is where, you know, it will either thrive or it will be readily available or not available. And obviously, you would like to make it more sustainable. Let's talk about how do edible insects compare to the traditional livestock in terms of either environmental impact and sustainability? Insects are much more smaller than your traditional livestock. I'll make uh, an example. Let's compare beef and crickets. Crickets, which are edible in most parts of the world. In South Africa as well, some people do eat insects. And in Zimbabwe, to make one kilogram of protein from beef, you need 30,000 liters of water. And for a locust, you need 15 liters of water. To raise one kg of protein for beef, you need 40 kilograms of feed. And for locusts, you need three kgs. In terms of land or space that you require, to raise one kilogram of protein, you need 250 square meters of land. And for a cricket, the same amount of protein, you need 15 square meters of land. So just from comparing that, you can now think of, let's say, a head of cattle, or let's say you need 100 kilograms of beef. How much of the natural resources you actually require to produce that protein from beef? And remember, you can't eat the whole cow. You can't eat the bones. You can't eat the skin. You can't eat the fur on the cow. So you use all these resources to feed this animal, but you can use all of it for food. On a cricket, on the other hand, you consume the whole insect. So when you're looking at it from those two angles, you can see that the environmental cost of beef versus an insect like locusts or mealworm or mopani is considerably, the differences are huge. And the impacts are very small for insects versus your traditional livestock. That's why you will often hear a term like small farms when referring to insect farming because the resources that you require are quite small but the protein that you get out of those insects is quite big it's comparable to be so that's basically what the environmental impacts of edible insects are compared to your your traditional language but then again for insects for it to be sustainable you need to be actively farming So what we've seen in South Africa is that there isn't a lot of that happening and we would like to get that going from some front, get more people involved investing in agriculture, farming insects for human consumption. Some people tend to think, oh, you're going to feed us crickets, you know, they can be processed into different forms that are much more acceptable to a wider variety of consumers or customers. You know, you can have cricket powder that can be turned into a whole lot of products. So you still get your protein, but a much more sustainable protein compared to when you get the same protein from beef, for example. Thanks for that overview, Puti. Now, when we talk about the nutritional benefits of incorporating edible insects into one's diet, if I'm a new person, I'm not really familiar with eating insects, and I've now listened to this podcast, for example, and I'm interested to know more, how would you kind of present it to me to understand what the benefits of, you know, as someone to incorporate it into my diet? So in terms of nutritional benefits of insects, 
it's been proven that insects actually contain much more protein than than beef. They have been found to have much more fiber than spinach, and they have been found to be an all-rounder in terms of having important nutrients that you need from food. For example, when you compare protein contact of insects, almond pennyworms, for example, 58% protein, compare that to beef where you find that in beef has less protein when you compare it to what you find in Mopani. And the range of minerals that you get from insects, considering their size, when you compare that to beef or to chicken, you find that they contain more essential nutrients. So from that standpoint as well, coupled with the environmental impacts of edible insects and the sustainability question with insects, then you find that you are not only having nutritious food on your plate but you are having food that is has a less impact on the environment so you are having an all-rounder meal that is good for you and it's good for your planet so definitely my next question was specifically answered in your comments now where it talks about maybe the challenges but also the opportunities in the widespread adoption of edible insects as a food source I think people are becoming really conscious of what they eat and they've been very conscious since, you know, COVID started. It's, it is something that's more top of mind for people. But maybe you can talk about first the opportunities, but also some of the challenges that you've had in the industry. With insects, they have an ill factor to a lot of people that are not accustomed to seeing them on a plate. I'm going to be a little bit controversial now, but you find in a South African setting where a large majority of the Black population that eat insects. And then you find a large majority of the white population that don't eat insects, but they are the people that are in charge of their buyers in companies. For example, if you go to a company like Woolworths, for example, or Pick and Pay, and you try to get in touch with one of the buyers, in more cases than most, you'll find that the buyer will be white. And then when you approach them with this, I have this idea, I'm selling insects. For them, immediately it's like, whoa, what is that? It becomes like a cultural shock. So you have sort of like a disjoint between the shops understanding the product and the customers on the other hand, who, yes, they do eat the insects, but, you know, they can't find it in shops. They have other ways of getting it. They So to sort of like bring the two together and say, you know, we have a food source here that's not being given the opportunity to be available to everybody. You need to first start educating the shops to say, you know, this is something that is widely practiced in the country. Why do you not cater for it? It almost even brings to mind this whole idea. If you go back to the whole straight hair, curly hair, what you find in the shops, if you find hair relaxes, you will relax your hair. But if you take the hair relaxes out of the shops, people are not going to relax it, that type of thing. So you almost need to come to a point where you educate the industry about edible insects and they become comfortable with it, comfortable enough to be able to communicate with the rest of the population to say, you can actually eat this. It is a long journey. We need to educate our customers, our population about the advantages of actually adopting edible insects as food. We also need to educate our agriculturists, our farmers, for example, about the importance of having edible insects as part of their feed. I mean, when you go into that side of things where you incorporate insects like your black soldier fly larvae in terms of feeding and recycling of your waste and all of that, it actually sort of like it helps in covering costs for farmers. You know, when it's time for you to get rid of waste, you can feed it to your flies. And then when you get your larvae, you can feed it to your chickens. So it sort of like closes the whole recycling loop and nutrient loop and a whole circular economy loop that we have in agriculture. The challenges are educating the people about them and the opportunities are there. The world now is moving towards accepting this. When I mean the world, I mean the Western world, because if you go to the East and you go to most countries in Africa, you'll find that the the culture of eating insects is already there. So uh, big organizations like the UN Food, they are now there with us saying, yes, we accept that insects are the way to go. And here are some funds, here are some support in terms of the opportunities. So there is a whole lot of movement now where you're having, there is so much research and development 
geared towards edible insects. I think mostly in the Western world, it's the environmental and sustainability aspects of it that has been winning the fight, you know. People want to have a healthier planet. People want healthier food and looking for solutions. And at this point in time, edible insects seem to be the the, the solution for, for this problem. I mean, you can talk for days about the impacts of livestock farming in terms of the stresses on our resources, the methane pollution associated with that, what you do with the waste after, and then come edible insects where you actually use the entire insect and your um, impacts are quite small, but your nutritional impact on the other hand are quite big. So the opportunities are there, the difficulties are there, and we'll get around them. I definitely want to see how we can welcome you back to this podcast at the later stage. I feel like we just touched the surface with this topic and more of the work that you guys are doing, you know, advocating for the industry and the fact that there's this body that now represents it is absolutely amazing. So I'd like to say to you, thank you for being here. And if you could just give like one final message for both consumers, people in the industry, whether agriculture, whether on agro-processing side, what would that be? And also maybe something to encourage people to test their palate when it comes to insects, if they're not familiar with it, you know, in a traditional setting when they didn't grow up eating it. A couple of hundred years ago, the potato was a strange food in this part of the world, but it's now being eaten across everywhere you can find a version of a potato. It took time, I can imagine, to convince people that this is a food source that you can eat. And it will take time in terms of insects. It surely gets the whole world moving around it. But, you know, we should keep moving forward. And engagements, engaging with each other, joining groups, exchanging ideas, that is always um, a thing that will move us forward. I mean, we cannot say we want to move to a a different point and not talk about it. We talk about it. What are the challenges? How do we get over it? Let's exchange ideas. How do we tackle this problem? And for all the people that are actively involved in either farming of edible insects or selling them, you're doing great. Keep going. You can contact our organization, IFASA, if you'd like to become a member of it so that you can contribute towards building this industry. And for the people that are a little bit skeptical, There are 2 billion people in the world who are already eating insects and they're doing just fine. And nothing will happen to you if you try insects. You'll become part of the 2 billion and maybe we can get the number to 5 billion. Who knows? Insects are really delicious. Some people will often ask you, what do they taste like? And the best answer is that they taste like insects. So if you want to know, you got to try some. Now, whether you're enjoying crunchy crickets in Thailand, or protein-packed termites here in Africa. I trust this conversation has shifted your thinking about the culinary traditions that have embraced these tiny delights for centuries. It was an absolute pleasure to have you join us here on Farmers Inside Track. Puti Kabasa, founder of Mopani Queens. You can of course read more about her farming journey by visiting www.foodformzanzi.co.za. And that's a wrap from me, Donumdu. Our technical producer, Megan van der Fent, and the rest of the hashtag Team Food from Zanzi. Thanks so much for listening. Bye for now. Life in South Africa can be a lot. I mean, scroll through Twitter for a minute and tell me I'm wrong. Thank God for South Africans though, right? We're inspiring, and even on the bad days, we fight back with a smile. That's why I love Food from Zanzi so much. They're not ashamed to celebrate the ordinary unsung heroes who work every day to put food on our nation's tables. Go to foodformzanzi.co.za and never miss an inspiring story.